Right, we're going to get started with this week's session whilst our attendees still join us. So firstly, hello, uh, welcome, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Student Bytes. My name is George Wright and I'm the Student Engagement Lead here at my G-Work. I'm responsible for helping our graduates. Today on Student Bytes, we're talking to Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner, BCLP, uh, who are a partner of my G-Work. And you can find their organisation page, some of their staff and all of their job postings over on the website. As the student engagement lead, I'm responsible for our student engagement, as the title suggests. Um, and so if you'd like to have a chat, if you have ideas, you just want to get involved, please feel free to email me. Uh, you can find me over on my G-Work or you can alternatively find me on LinkedIn. But before we get into this week's discussion and we meet our panel, let's revisit some of the top stories of the week. Gaming franchise Call of Duty has introduced a non-binary option as part of the new Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War campaign. Along with choosing their gender, players can also select their name, skin colour and origin story. The usual male and female options are there, as well as a non-binary option. Characters will refer to the player with the proper they and them pronouns in voice and text throughout the campaign to reflect the choice. In a recent interview, Dan Von Drack of Raven Software opened up about the new gender option stating, it was important for us when we started the character creation system. As I mentioned, I grew up in the 80s and my formative gaming years were in the 80s. He continued, back then you didn't have these deep character creation systems. You had to make everything up in your head. One of our goals was to get back to, into the mindset that we have for the ones that grew up in the 80s where everything lived in your head. When it came together, the same thing was thrown out. Why can't we leave that classified? There's no reason we can't do that. We're already going to make it uh, change the he and she. So it was easy enough for us to use those different pronouns there as well. That was where the decision came into play for that choice. In the past, the $9.7 billion franchise faced some black backlash for having non-playable characters discuss sexuality and reference the controversial phrase, don't ask, don't tell. In the UK, the Supreme Court is to hear a significant LGBT rights case which could force the country to adopt internationally recognised, non-gendered, exed option in passports. Christy Alain Kane, a non-binary campaigner, has been fighting for three decades for exed passports, and now the fight will go to the UK's top court. I've campaigned for nearly 30 years for legitimate identity that most people can take for granted. Legitimate identity is a fundamental human right that includes the right to obtain an accurate ID, Alain Kane said whilst talking to Forbes. Following the news, uh, per case will go ahead after being denied at the Court of Appeal in March. Elaine Kane, who uses per slash per self pronouns added, legitimate identity is a fundamental human right, but non-gendered people are treated as though we have no rights. The UK government has, over a period of years spanning into the decades, barely acknowledged our existence and refuses to acknowledge our disenfranchise while its systems and bureaucracy render us socially invisible. Kane adds, the ex-passport is an essential for anyone who defines their identity as neither male nor female. Some gender trans people and intersex people would also prefer not to have a gendered reference on their ID. If the M or F reference is not how the person presents, then that person is likely to encounter problems whether that is problems at the airport or problems at the polling station. X identifiers on passports alongside M and F comply with UN International Civil, Asia Civil Aviation Organization accepted standards, ultimately meaning all countries can choose to introduce them for their citizens by including them in the application process. It is worth noting that passports with genderless options are available to people in Australia, Austria, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Iceland, India, Malta, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Nepal, Pakistan, and Uruguay. Just this week, Belgium's new government announced it would introduce gender neutrality, neutrality through its term and make it possible for non-binary citizens to use gender X. And finally, Out Soccer star Colin Martin has validated a new study reported in Out Sports that found that male athletes are widely accepting of their gay teammates as the only out major athlete in American professional sports league. He is now urging all LGBT plus athletes to come out. Martin, a midfielder for the San Diego Loyals major league soccer team, made headlines this fall when his team walked off the pitch and forfeited a game in protest of a homophobic slur aimed at him by Phoenix Rising's Junior Flemings. Not only did his teammates give up a win that day by having Martin's back, but they lost a spot in the playoffs. 
Obviously, walking off the field was emotional for everyone that day, Martin said during a phone conversation he had with the advocate over the weekend. I was feeling a ton of different things, slight embarrassment and anger among them, but in the locker room after the game, and after losing our chance of the playoffs, it was also a lot for my teammates to handle. However, realising that together we took a big stand and it became a really big deal, and it was a testament that showed not only their support for me, but how close we all came over the season. And with that, we will get into our panel this week. So today we're talking to BCLP, Brian Cave Lane and Paisner, LLP, about what it means to be LGBT at the firm and how you can begin your journey in working with them. I am joined by Francesco Albanese and also by Iman Roy. Francesco Albanis is his name, but everyone calls him Fran. Fran was born and raised in the south of Italy before moving to the UK in 2017 to start a law degree at Queen Mary University, London. During the last academic year, he has worked at Brian Cave Leighton Paisner LLP as a placement student in their real estate finance department. During Fran's experience at the firm, he has gotten involved with a lot of extra departmental work, including the diversion, uh, inclusion and diversity team, the innovation solutions team, and graduate recruitment team. After 12 amazing months at the firm, he has managed to secure a training contract at BCLP starting in September of 2022. Uh, particular about Fran, which not many people know, is that he trained for seven years to become a ballet dancer. Iman is a senior associate at BCLP, specializing in derivatives. He was born before the advent of personal computers, smartphones, or even color televisions, let alone the internet, in India. After completing his first law degree, Iman did his LLM at Duke University, North Carolina. He subsequently worked with Linklaters and then with Maya Brown in Hong Kong, before moving to London in 2013 and joining the firm in 2015. Iman is actively involved in the firm's inclusion and diversity programs, mentoring scheme, and specific client development programs. Whilst neither aware, unaware or unaffected by discrimination, rather, Iman truly believes the initial reaction is what helps us to survive it, and our subsequent reaction is what helps us thrive despite it. So I am now going to invite our panel to join us. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, so I guess um, if you could start by telling me, telling us a little bit sort of about um, who BCLP are and, and kind of your roles with them. Yes, thank you, George. Um, Thanks, George. Let's try to say something that, I've, that you haven't already mentioned about me. So um, I've been a placement student at the firm. And as you said, I've worked with them last year in the real estate finance department. Um, BCLP is a multinational firm, fully, tran fully uh, international, and it um, was merged in 2018. It was a mer big merger between Brian Cave and uh, Berwin Leighton Paisner. Um, I started to work with them in September of last year and worked with them for, for an entire year. Uh, and I did my training contract assessment last year in July, last July, sorry. Um, and got offered a training contract which is going to start as you mentioned in September 2022. Uh, my role was um, the one of a placement student which is a bit of a unique role because it was a bit of a merger like an hybrid role between a paralegal and a trainee in a law firm. Uh, my day-to-day -day activities was uh, pretty much managing a transaction from, from all its uh, facets. So from communicating to clients, to drafting junior documents, um, contacting uh, opposing councils and local councils. What I enjoyed about my experience at the firm was that I've been given the chance to interact with many departments. As you mentioned in the introduction, I got involved not only with my real estate finance department, but also with uh, gradual recruitment, the innovation solution, and also uh, diversity and inclusion. So I could get a better understanding of what BCLP is and what they do um, in the legal sector as a whole. So that was really interesting. Um, I'll pass it on now to Iman. Now that's a hard act to follow about what I know about BCLP. Um, so I've been now with the firm for five and a half years. Um, and I tend to look at Look, when I started working, yes, I didn't really consider my sexual identity, my gender identity as playing a role um, within my employment prospect. It's, there is this divide which used to have between, okay, what's personal space and what's professional space. Um, 
and while not actively going back into the closet, um, I just became a non-issue. Um, a little bit of uh, a phrase which I haven't heard in a little while, don't ask, don't tell. Um, BCLP functions quite differently. Um, it's of the firms I have worked with. Uh, it was the first firm where at the very inception, I was told about how important inclusivity and diversity is. And it's actually shown in not just gender identity or sexual identity, but actually, and even in terms of the fact that BL, the erstwhile BLP and BCLP were both firms which were led by women. Um, it was the biggest transatlantic merger done by two firms led by women, which was pretty impressive. The London office is, of course, led by the amazing Shagun, who is of African descent. Um, so there is, uh, the firm doesn't just talk, it walks the talk. And that, that extends to um, LGBTQ issues. Um, the firm has a number of firsts. It's one of the highest ranked firms when it comes to its LGBTQ inclusivity and policies. Um, and from my perspective, though LGBTQ rights is something I was passionate about, it was the firm's ethos which actually encouraged me to get involved. It's quite, um, the firm's enthusiasm rubs off on you. So even if you came in, which was my mindset that, look, I'm going to come here, do my work, which is long enough hours and just get out. Um, I couldn't stay that way just because the firm is so passionate about the issue. Um, so, yeah, um, back to you, Fran. Uh, I don't think I have anything to add on this question, to be fair. I think much has been said by Iman on the kind of ethos and the culture of the firm. I just need to further agree on what he mentioned. The, uh, the firm does really play a big role in supporting their LGBTQ employees. And I think we'll have the chance to speak about this later on in, the, in this um, event. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you both of you um, for that. I suppose kind of my next question is more about, you know, how did you get into your current sort of career at BCLP and, and what kind of made you want to apply? I appreciate you've sort of come from different perspectives, both from like a student perspective and as someone who sort of worked in other firms. So I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit more about that. Um, sure. Um, for me, it's a pretty circuitous route. Um, as you mentioned that I got my degree in India and then I did my LLM at Duke and kind of kind of picked straight away to my to to, to start with Linklater's. Um, so when I joined the firm, it was basically I was looking for a change. Um, I wasn't a derivatives lawyer. I looked at myself as a more of a structured finance lawyer. Um, but what impressed me about the firm when I was and I was interviewing with a number of firms was the fact that it was one of the few interview processes where I came out. Um, having learned something more than just um, answer questions. So the partners actually um, taught me something new about law, added to my knowledge as part of the interview process. Um, that doesn't happen very often. So that told me a bit about the attitude of the partners I'll be reporting to, that they wanted to invest in making me better, not just getting the job done, but making me into a better lawyer. Um, and then uh, the derivatives team is a fairly small team, but, and, and I usually claim that my boss sucked me into his life of crime because he made it extremely interesting. And I, I did a client secondment, which went well enough. The client is still a client, so they did not see my work and run for the hills, which is good. Um, and, um, and, and, and what's been great is because the firm encourages innovation, the firm encourages, um, irrespective of your level, to actually step up and do more if you want to. Um, and forgive me, this will sound as a brag, but it's, it's more of an example that though it, the derivatives practice is a new practice, it is listed as, a, a, as, as one of the tiered firms. And um, I have I've had the good fortune of being listed as a 
what they call a rising star by legal, legal 500 for the last few years. And that is because of the opportunities created by the practice. So that one notion when I did the interview and they were teaching me and that's part of the interview kind of played off. And that's why where I am currently. Fran? Thank you so much, Iman. Um, as George said, I think I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective to this to this question, the one, the perspective of, of a student. Um, even though I'm in my final year now, I still remember uh, me being a first year student, first year law student, um, walking in the dark, not knowing where to apply, what to apply to. Um, the, the, the firms that were on the table were just so many and I, and I was bombarded with information from different firms, different career departments, different events. I remember one day attending a panel events with multiple firms and on this event, there was uh, someone from BCLP. And uh, during the networking session, I remember that what I felt when I spoke to that person from BCLP and it was just different because um, all the other people there, it seemed that they were there for a reason, that they were there because they had to be there. While the people from BCLP were really personable, engaging, it seemed as if they were there because they wanted to get to know you rather than the other way around. And that felt amazing because uh, I could interact with them and create a relationship even though it was a 10 minutes chat or a 20 minutes chat, it felt as if they cared about who you were, uh, where, did, where you were coming from, what you wanted to, to gain out of a career in, a, in the legal sector. So that was the first hint that told me, okay, look, I think BCLP is a good firm. Like this, is, this firm is actually standing out from the crowd of, of other firms that are probably doing similar things. When I received the opportunity to apply for the placement scheme through my, um, through my degree, I was like, well, I'm killing two birds with one stone. I can have the chance to get real life work experience, which is fundamental if you're a law student. Um, and I'm gonna actually do it in a firm that I like, that, I'm, that I already know about. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a good chance. Um, I applied for this. I remember the the partner interview. That was my first ever partner interview that I've ever done in my life. So I was really scared. And when I did it and I came back home, I felt as if I had a chat with, I don't know, with a friend. And that was really weird because, you know, I've, been, I've always imagined partner interview to be um, very, um, I'm not saying, I don't want to say professional as, as if it was unprofessional, but, you know, I was, I was, I was always imagined partner to be cold hearted with poker faces being there to like interrogate you, but it wasn't like that at all. I remember um, talking to a senior associate and a partner and they were there just to, you know, ask me a question and have a really nice conversation. I remember them smiling and being really friendly and approachable and that made, made me feel really comfortable. And that continued throughout my career at BCLP. So when I walked in the first day, everyone asked me to go for a coffee, to get lunch together, to uh, talk to me, to understand why I was there, what, what I wanted to achieve, what I wanted to get out of the placement. And throughout the entire placement, every single day, that was the kind of um, culture, vibe, attitude that everyone had. And that was definitely one of the main reasons why I decided to apply for a training contract and decide to pursue a training contract at the firm because I understood that that was a place where it wasn't only about the work that you were doing it was also about your personality and the way you felt within the workplace and for me that was fundamental because as a, an LGBTQ individual I always knew that I wanted to work in an environment where not only I'm going to have the chance to progress from a career perspective but also be accepted and valued for who I really was and that is something that uh, BCLP has offered and BCLP continues to do um, something something else which I always mention when they ask me why the firm is the non-hierarchical structure of the firm I remember uh, one of the first few weeks seeing trainees walking into partner's office and asking for a 10 minutes catch-up or asking to you know for some question a transaction they were working on and partners the majority of them I'm sure that not all of them are like that but partners are always like um really keen in answering questions and supporting everybody. And that's because there's no hierarchy. Everyone is equal. They're, we all treat each other um, the same way. As a matter of fact, that's one of the core values of BCLP. So treating your 
colleagues as if it's your best client. And that is really the case. It's not something that we put on our website just because we want to show that we have cool core values. It's act it actually happens within the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, and, and that's something that really shocked me because it shows that the support you receive doesn't always doesn't only come from your supervisor, who's probably, you know, you might think expected to support you, but it comes from everyone in the firm, from graduate recruitment, from diversity and inclusion, from the partner themselves, who are the probably busiest person in the room, they will, you know, come to your desk and say, hey, how are you doing? How's, how's everything going? And that's something that really um, marked me. And I felt like as if, and I felt that that was the kind of workplace where I wanted to be a collaborative communicative, supportive work environment. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic insight. And I wonder if I could just ask a little bit further. So you sort of mentioned this you know, as a student placement. And I just wondered, was this something offered um, to your university, perhaps your university's partner with BCLP, or was this something that was just open as, as a general student position? What, what, what kind of was the process there? Um, it's, uh, it's something that my university, which is Quimari University, offered direct, like offer only to Quimari students. And it's a, it's a sort of like collaboration that BCLP does with Quimari University. Well, as a matter of fact, we are the first ever university that offers such kind of placement. And we do it both with BCLP and with Reed Smith. So yeah, it's specifically tailored to Queen Mary students. But I think that's evidence of the fact that um, BCLP is open to recruit from very different kind of perspectives. So not only through their, you know, vacation scheme and training contract, which is the main way, but also uh, it's it, it opens to other things like placement schemes or internships, which we have an insight scheme. So uh, the if talent come talent doesn't mean only to come from a certain pool of candidates, which are probably the direct training contracts or the one that apply for the opportunity, but BCLP discovers candidates and potential talents in different ways, such as, you know, placement schemes or insight scheme or other kind of opportunities. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Very, very appreciative. Um, so my next question, what, what I appreciate COVID has changed a lot, but what was your office office life like before the pandemic and sort of how has that changed now as, as we've moved through, well, two lockdowns now? <laughs> um, the funny thing is, we've actually moved offices um, during the pandemic. Um, so when we, you know, pretty much ran out of the office, you know, shrieking about the pandemic first time around in March, it was in one office where we had been for, you know, for decades. It was a pretty historic building just on the River Thames. Um, and now when we started going back for a little bit and um, during the two lockdowns, I was actually, you know, trotting into the office a couple of times a week just to get back into the habit of commuting. Um, uh, um, it's a very different office environment. It's, uh, for the lack of a better word, snazzier place with like lifts and rooftop gardens and uh, whatnot. Um, so the pre-pandemic, it was, it was a very vibrant place. Um, as Fran mentioned, you know, we pretty much have um, an op open door policy, i.e. you can approach any partner or any senior associate and have a chat um, about the work you're doing, if you have any concerns, if you have any questions, or even if you just want to introduce yourself because you're just seeing what the firm is about. It's very, it really believes in the open door policy. And yes, uh, there are a lot of coffee meetings. There are a lot of lunchtime gatherings and catching ups. Um, on Fridays, often there is a drinks trolley. Um, uh, um, so a, a lot of um, the, the social interaction happens on the job um, over a cup of coffee, over a cup of tea. We have an amazing uh, cafeteria which serves pretty delicious food surprisingly um, so that's also a pretty regular gathering place where you would very often bump into some of even the senior partners and they will ask you for your opinion of how the food is like um, it's a very collegiate place it's a very it's um, and 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 interestingly enough that essence of collegiality has not diminished 
or has not been adversely affected by move, moving into a more remote working style. Um, you know, for example, I can speak for my immediate team, which is derivatives and the broader team of structured finance. We have daily derivative calls and it's as much about getting to know what somebody else is doing, but also making sure everyone is okay, everyone has the support they need. Because for many people, for example, me and some of my colleagues, we are effectively home alone. So that consciousness that you know people are working in different circumstances, some people are working with entire families and they need to juggle that, but there are equally people who are locked down for them means being without any kind of uh, social system in place. So the firm is very cognizant of that. The firm regularly does check up and does keep give us visibility about what's happening within the firm. There have been a few um, Zoom or WebEx events. Um, so the, there has been a conscious effort to make sure no one feels isolated from the firm, as it were. Um, Fran? Thank you, man. Yes, I completely, I completely agree. And um, without trying to, without trying to reiterate what you mentioned, I completely agree with that. When I was in the office um, before the pandemic, as I said, it was a really collaborative team working culture. But apart from the work that we were doing, it was really friendly. So as Iman mentioned, a lot of coffee catch ups, a lot of tea, a lot of going to for lunch together and getting involved in in social when social were there and um, the drink strolly as as it's it's really a firm where where people want to to interact with you and create that create with that strong relationship because having a good relationship with your colleague i think it's fundamental if you're gonna then work together and um i completely agree with the with the point on the cafeteria uh, and not on the on the food yes of course really good food but on the fact that at the cafeteria you could meet a partner or a senior associate and just have a chat with them i still remember um, taking some taking a coffee and and talking with daisy reeves who's the is our uh, co-chair of the lgbtq network and partner in the banking department and having a coffee and, and, and she came up to me and complimented me because I had a rainbow linear on. And from that moment, I just always met her while, while I was having coffees and, and, and we, um, we started chatting and she remembered me. So that was really good. And I, and I think, again, it connects to the fact that people are just, you know, very genuinely friendly and interested in to get to get to know you and talk to you and, and have a construct a good relationship with you. It's really a, a pleasant environment, in my opinion. Um, and uh, uh, something that I all, all, all also appreciate at the moment, this is a bit of a, uh, of a, a taboo topic for the firm. We just switched to our new, to our new office uh, in Governor's House, which has all open plans. And I'm quite fun of it. I've, 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 I've went there and I quite like it. It's really snazzy. And what I always mention in these kind of events is the fact that I think the open plan is further evidence of the fact that there is a non-hierarchical structure. Everyone is equal because partners, senior associate trainees and legal secretaries of all of them have the same desk, the same screen, the same wardrobe size. And it just really speaks about the kind of culture that there is. You, you are, we're all sitting there together in the same space, albeit probably uh, crumbed up in a room, but still really like all together as if we are one team, one firm working towards the same goal. It's not that since I'm a trainee, I'm in a, you know, a uh, dark corridor and the partner has a shiny um, corner office. It's not like that. And, and I think it's a really good kind of evidence that speaks about the culture and the way that he feels to be in the office while working at BCLP. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic insight, particularly on sort of firm culture. Um, and I just sort of wondered, actually, I, I, I know you mentioned sort of about the rainbow lanyard. It, it leads me quite nicely to my next question about um, the LGBT network at BCLP. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the LGBT network and, and what kind of work they do, if that's possible. Um, so, OK, I'll start with what what um, I enjoy the most about the LGBTQ network. And, you know, you have the LGBTQ network and you have the extended Allies Network, which has now over 630 participants in Allies alone globally, um, is the fact, and I think this is a, just in a nutshell tells you about the firm's attitude, 
the pride party at, uh, at, at BCLP is not thrown by the LGBTQ community. It's thrown for the LGBTQ community by the allies. So it's, um, which starts with actually raising the rainbow flag on, on, the, on, on a flagpole we used to have in, 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 our, um, in Adelaide House, our previous office. Um, and, you know, Lisa Mayhew, who's the firm co-chair, she would usually come and raise the flag. Um, and we do the same thing um, uh, um, across for different um, communities. And that is, in a nutshell, what the firm is about. It's very open about how they perceive its LGBTQ staff, which is nothing but complete support in any way with we, which we require. And it is also one of those areas where the firm has a zero tolerance policy in the sense of, it isn't the case of, oh, you made a silly joke and you get a pass, you know, and three strikes, you're out. That's not the case. It's one strike, you're out. The firm has zero tolerance policy for any kind of discrimination and it lives by that rule. Um, it's, it has a global reach in terms of, it's small things. It's when you join the firm, you're given a lovely rainbow notebook and a pen and a lanyard. Um, and it's so popular that people actually come and ask for it. It's so popular, it's become discussion points. Um, even in certain offices, because you know we do have offices in places like Russia and in the Middle East, where this is a sensitive topic, and you know we are aware of what the local regulations, local laws, and the local restrictions are. But and we do work to ensure that we are compliant. But it also doesn't mean that anybody over there who ha who identifies has a specific gender or sexuality identification feels left out in the cold or cut off from the firm. So for example, um, the Russian offices, the rainbow note notebooks were extremely popular. Um, and that's our way of ensuring that we recognize that you're in a difficult location, but we will, as a firm, try to make you as comfortable at as humanly possible to make it um, and make you feel included within the community that we are. Um, you know, the firm is a signatory of many of the protective charters which firms enter into its credentials in terms of um, whether it be Stonewall or the US indexes, they are, they are, they are par excellence. Um, the firm, again, and this is maybe another example, but I think examples are the best way to tell you what the firm is actually about rather than throwing in the correct words. Um, we had a colleague of ours who was posted to the Middle East, um, who was uh, who was gay, and uh, his partner, who also worked at the firm uh, uh, in a more managerial role, um, needed some needed. They needed to spend some time together. So the firm actually came up with the position so that they could live in the Middle East, have separate apartments, but have the comfort of each other's company. Um, so the firm is extremely sympathetic to both ensuring that people are safe within the relevant jurisdictions, but also get the support they need. Um, and uh, throughout the lockdown, for example, we've the LGBTQ community, the LGBTQ board has constantly met up. We actually launched the Global Allies program during the lockdown, and you know it, it, it was quite a success given just a breadth of people who joined up. Um, and we do occasionally also tie up with our clients to do events. Um, so which again kind of reiterates again and again um, our ethos when it comes to diversity. Um, Fran? Uh, thanks, Iman. I think that was a beautiful uh, explanation as to the kind of culture of, of support that there is at BCLP. I don't have a lot to add on this, but I think that what really stood out to me was the fact that, and I think this is different from other, not only law firms, but workplace in general, was the fact that the support that you would like to receive 
as an LGBTQ individual in a workplace doesn't necessarily come only from the LGBTQ network itself or the diversity and inclusion network, but it comes from everyone in the firm. And that is because everyone is um, aware of your presence there as an LGBTQ individual and will support you no matter what. So I noticed that if I would ever feel as if I needed a su support, it, would have it could have come from my supervisor or someone in my office and the LGBTQ network itself. And I think that this, this speaks the fact that the network, it's not a just a small community or a closed um, a club where people can get support, but rather is, is, is just evidence to the kind of culture that there is throughout the entire office. So it's everyone in the office both if they are part of the LGBTQ and ally or not, I think that everyone is really supportive of who you are from having a chat. I remember, like, again, as Iman said, I think making examples really helps in this. I remember being in a, in a social and there was a senior associate and this person knew of my sexuality. And um, this person asked me, like, told me straight on, look, I am not your supervisor, but I would be happy to go for a coffee with you in any moment you will like me to be there for you i am here for you no matter no matter what even if i'm not your supervisor and i'm i'm just an associate in this department if you need help call me and we can go for a coffee so i think this really speaks to the fact that anyone really anyone in the office is there to help you out and create a very deep connection with you and try to support you no matter who you are, your sexual identity, gender, your sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, anything really, whatever problem you're facing, someone, if you, if you speak it, if you, if you say it, someone will be there, I'm, I'm sure. And, and it doesn't come from the institutional support, which I'm sure in every firm there is. So an LGBTQ network or a diversity and inclusion team, it comes from, everyone from your trainee buddy to a senior associate to the I don't know managing partner of the firm. Excellent. Thank you for that. One I suppose sort of side question. Um was the was your Pride Network able to celebrate Pride at all this year? I appreciate Prides all over the world were kind of shut down, but was the firm able to sort of do its own kind of thing or, or what kind of happened there if I may ask? So yeah we did celebrate Pride in our own way. What we do is um we, uh, we do these profiles. Pro, uh, we did a coming out profile of a number of uh, our colleagues. Um, and what's great about the firm is that occasionally in firms, you can end up running the risk of there being the lawyers and then the business support staff and then the rest. Uh, in our firm, there isn't one. There is one single community for all. Um, and we had some amazing coming out stories. We had... Um, uh, we, you know, we did, you know, Zoom meetings, etc. over it. Um, we also, on a very regular basis, do stay in touch with what's happening within, uh, uh, like George, the update you gave at the very beginning of, you know, recent events. To a certain extent, we are aware of that. Um, I recall uh, in about now nearly four years ago when um, India decriminalized homosexuality yikes um um i remember sending out a message to you know just a core lgbtq team um as uh, uh, you know as it were and then it got further disseminated because it was an information which was relevant to the whole firm and the messages i got were people completely outside the network and that kind of continues to today we keep getting updates and we keep celebrating that um so yeah, Pride wasn't, we didn't have the Pride party, we missed out. Last year it was a Hawaiian theme, which was absolutely amazing. Um, um, hopefully next year we'll get twice the amount of party out of it. Um, but we did celebrate in our own way of celebrating the stories of people who have either lived through a situation where Pride wasn't an option um, or celebrating people who have been able to surmount difficulties to be where they are today, um, irrespective of the barriers, societal barriers, legal barriers, which has been put in their way due to their sexuality. Um, so it was, it was quite a learning experience. It was quite a moving experience. 
I completely agree, Iman. Just to add on that, I, I, I was, I really, really loved and appreciated the this um, coming out. Uh, uh, newsletter that we that we organized for the it wasn't for pride but it was for ca- coming out there coming out there right. um, it was it was uh, it was it was something that really uh, well I was one of the people that spoke that that wrote uh, a story about coming out but I think again this is evidence to the kind of culture that BCLP wants to create and has already because. That's what makes a difference in between workplaces and between organization. On the one hand, we have the really colorful rainbow one that says that they are diverse and inclusive, that they say they have an LGBTQ network, but then you start working for them and, and it's ash ash. Nobody speaks about uh, sexual identity. Nobody knows. Um, as Iman said, don't ask, don't tell. And then there are other organizations like, B- like BCLP in which not only it is fine for you to speak about your sexual orientation, but actually, look, we are celebrating who you are by sending out a newsletter with your story. And I think it is really com- sends a message and it sends the message to look, anyone around you could be LGBTQ, has gone through this kind of process. And it, it really brings away the kind of stigmatization that there is around both coming out and being LGBTQ. And it's something that I really appreciate it because again, it is evidence that BCLP is working. It is not just saying they are diverse and inclusive. They are doing something about it to create a culture of uh, inclusive inclusivity and support that I think other um, organizations don't have. That was lovely. Thank you very, very much for your insights on that. I very much appreciate it. I'm now going to turn the topic of our panel more towards um, the recruitment process. So I guess just sort of to break ground on this, you know, how does BCLP recruit and, and what kind of process are our applicants looking at there? Um, yes, sorry. Um, BCLP recruits undergraduate and graduate through their vacation scheme and training contract. For those people that don't know what a vacation scheme or training contract is, vacation scheme is usually a two weeks experience where you come into the firm, you are you sit in a department or two departments, and then you get to do a bit of tasks, you get to understand the, in, the insights of the firm, and you learn more about it. And then at the end of it, you have an interview for a training contract. And the training contract is the, is the kind of standard experience that you got to do in order to become a solicitor and it's a two-year experience that you get to do it at the firm you like. Um, The application process is divided into three parts mainly. We have our standard application form and that is um, the 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 website in which you, you get in, you put your education details, your work experience, your hobbies and interest, and then we have the application questions. The application questions are usually like based on your understanding of the firm, why you want to work for us. So it's really competency-based. And this year we have four application questions. And as part of this application form, when you send it out, you also need to do an online test, which is a bespoke BCLP test. It is a situational judgment test where prospective applicants needs needs to answer situational judgment questions. So there are questions such as, what would you do in this situation? Or uh, how would you react? Or do you agree or do, do you disagree? What really is important about this test that it is bespoke to BCLP. So it is. it was created by the graduate recruitment team by working with all the trainees of the firm to make it as if it is like kind of like a trainee test. So it's, it is based in order to understand whether you have the necessary skills to be a trainee at BCLP. So it's really a specific and um, it's quite, it's, it's quite also based on how would you react and kind of your personality. So it's, it's quite a good test and not one that you need to prepare for. So it's, it's quite a good experience in my opinion. Uh, and this is the first stage. When you pass this first stage, you, if you pass this first stage, you go into the second stage, which is an interview, pre-interview with graduate recruitment and development team. This interview usually lasts between 30 and 45 minutes. And it's an interview with a mixture of career motivation questions, such as why do you want to work at BCLP? Why do you want to have a career in law? Um, why do you want to have a training contract here rather, there some, rather than somewhere else? And then some competency-based questions, such as um, when was the last time you worked in a team? Or tell me how you go about legal research. So question in order to show that you have gained a certain skill set. If you are um, successful at this stage, you move into the last stage, which is the assessment center stage. 
this uh, the assessment day is divided into three section. Uh, the first one um, is, is usually the case study uh, where students are faced with a bundle of documents that they need to go through, read, and then present uh, in front of two fee earners of the firm, a case study of 10 minutes. So they need to present on what they understood and what is the task that they're required to do. The second part of the assessment day is the negotiation exercise. This is a group negotiation in which four potential, ap potential applicants are faced with a negotiation scenario. They get uh, two different briefs and they talk with their teammate and then negotiate for around uh, 40 minutes. And the last bit of the assessment day is usually the, uh, the, the interview. This is usually an interview with one partner and one associate, but it could also be two partners. There is usually at least one partner. This interview is similar to the one that you do with graduate recruitment in the second stage, but it is much more specific and they go more in depth with their kind of question. So it is still about the kind of uh, motivational question that you would expect. So why the firm? But they would expect from you much deeper and more detailed and thought, thought through answers. So they want to see whether you have researched the firm, if you have, if you are, if you have commercial awareness, um, and usually the question will go from uh, commercial awareness question to why the firm to scale based question. So they're really broad in that perspective. And if you're successful at the assessment day, then you get either the vacation scheme or the training contract because the, the process is the same for both of them. Excellent, thank you. And I just out of curiosity, as I know, um, Emma, and you sort of mentioned about sort of the company having other, other um, pardon me, other offices um, around the world. I just wondered, is there the opportunity for secondments during that training contract? Is that a sort of thing that's that's addressed after sort of qualifying? No, absolutely. There are there are you know seats, and I think Singapore and, and and in Hong Kong and some of the other offices. So there are definite secondment opportunities for trainees, um, but. The one thing which I always tell is that, look, because you can have second, because our firm also has secondment opportunities with clients. So um, at the trainee level, um, including, for example, one of my secondees um, go in, and this, it's usually a second seat or a third seat trainee who goes in at one of the biggest investment banks there are globally. Um, and it's an exciting six months. Um, so there are definite secondment opportunities. But it's, and this is something I would tell irrespective of the, the venue is, you know, secondment sound a lot glamorous, but you should always try to put it in context of your career um, goals. Um, so for example, if I am, you know, if I want to be a finance lawyer, um, doing, let's say an intellectual property secondment somewhere may not make logical sense. It might give me a six month, uh, a six month all inclusive paid trip to a, a nice part of the world. And that's, the, the, yeah, and that's fair enough. But remember, I mean, it's, it's always a benefit analysis from a broader picture, but the opportunities are definitely there depending on your aspirations. Thank you very much for that kind of insight. That's that's really helpful, I think, for a lot of people sort of formulating their ideas there. Perfect. My next kind of question um, is more of a, a general about applicants. What kind of things are you looking for in applicants? What do you think sort of, you know, and to take a Q&A question we've got here, you know, what, what really can make a candidate stand out? Iman, would you like me to go first? Um, well, I can give, I think yours would be more topical. I can give some broad strokes first. Um, Look, at the end of the day, the, the firm has been very clear about its recruitment process, especially about the test. The reason was we do not want to get, you know, blinded by, you know, the top tier law schools and, and the best grades, because we recognize the fact that everyone has a story to tell. And just because you have the, you know, the best of universities and name doesn't really mean much beyond a certain point. Great, congratulations, that's an achievement. But there are other reasons why somebody might be going to another university and they deserve as much of a chance if we want to truly show a diverse pool of talent. Um, so that's why the, the, the entire graduate recruitment program has been set up as it is so that it's not just about, you know, a, a really amazing university's name or just about grades. 
being a lawyer is more than that. Believe me, my own university being something which isn't just even an English university kind of speaks to that. Um, now, the second thing is, and I think this is true, not just for our firm, but any firm, do not do cookie cutter. Uh, you know, very easily it is possible for us to read an essay or read an answer and know whether you have a general, general uh, Word document where you have kind of created this cookie cutter response and you cut and paste it for every application. You need to somehow show the fact that you have the, done the research for the firm. So um, my top tip would be make sure that you've basically scanned the entire website. You've, of course, also scanned stuff like Roll on Friday for the Goss because that's important from your perspective. Um, but make sure that you are genuinely aware about um, the firm and it's not just one size fits all because it doesn't and you do get caught out. The second thing I would suggest is make sure that whatever you're putting in your application form is something you can speak about. So, you know, you, you go more into your career, you start getting obsessed about CVs. But the top tip always is, and because I do a lot of CV training, is anything you've put in your CV, you should be able to articulate about. It's very, very important. So if you've put in that, you know, you've, uh, in, in one of your answers, you said about how you've spent six months working on, you know, child labor issues. Be prepared to talk about it if a question comes up, right? That's very, very important. The next thing is, you can only fake it in an answer to a certain point. There comes a time where you need to just say, I'm sorry, this is not something I have experienced before I, I'm aware of. Um, but I'd be interested to know how you would perceive this. You know, it would work from ma majority of the interviewers. In fact, in my first job, um, I got caught out. Um, I was, it was my, uh, my interview for Linklaters and, I was asked, you know, what I was seeing in the market and I wasn't. I was just kind of regurgitating something I had read in the newspaper five minutes before and I got caught out. So I was like, I just said that I'm sorry, but this is what I read in the paper this morning. I really don't know anything more beyond that. It was mortifying, but thankfully I was lucky enough to have a very patient partner or maybe they didn't have any other applicants, not sure. Um, but the point is, do not put on an act, be genuine because the the you know the poker faces of the partners would be there and they won't give cues away because that's their job but the more genuine they are the more they get to know you not a version of you the better for both parties concerned and the better better your chance of a success um so i think that would be my general tips in terms of applying fran now for the more experienced answer <laughs> Thank you, Van. Um, I think there are, lo there are a lot of things that I could mention, but I don't want to go into much detail. As Iman mentioned, I think being genuine and being yourself, as naive or cliche this might sound, is really the key to applying to a law firm. And, in, and this could be applicable to all the section of the application process that I just mentioned. If we look at the first section, the application form, um, you will find, for example, the hobbies and interest section. I think that some people perceive this as a section to show that you have won certain prices, like best law student or best student in, in my degree or something like that, but it's not. Hobbies and interest is actually hobbies and interest. Like, yes, of course, we want to know if you have won an award. That's amazing. But we also want to know, are you a photographer? Are you a ballet dancer like me? Are you, do you have something apart from law, which you do and makes you unique in the pool of applicants? So again, that's, that is connected to the be yourself, be genuine, tell us who you really are. And obviously, it's just an, it's just an example. Of course, it really uh, goes down to the kind of answers that you provide to the application question. Because even if the answer is, even if the, the majority of the question are always why you, how you do this or why you are applying. So it's always about you. Of course, it's also about the firm. You need to strike out that kind of balance between saying why you are applying to that specific firm and why you are the, that unique candidate they're looking for. But that, I think, is the key section. So when answering the problem, the, the, 
no problem question, the application question, I think it's always also important to connect it back to yourself. So sometimes when I'm mentoring individuals that are applying for BCLP, I see that many of them spend so much time explaining why the firm is amazing, why the firm stands out, what the firm has achieved, what kind of deals the firm does, but they don't use those words to explain why the firm should recruit that specific applicant. And, and that's really important. They want to know, the graduate recruitment person who's reading the application wants to know you, wants to get to know your story. You should use those 500 words to tell your own story. And that's really important because I always perceive the application process as a kind of like a business card. And in the business card, we want, you got to show what makes you, you, what, why you're so unique that the firm should pick you out of the, I don't know, 5,000 applicants. I'm just, I'm just saying numbers now. And that really is applicable to all the stages of the application and even more so at the partner interview because if you arrive at that stage and you're having a com like a communication with someone you can't think about uh, playing an act as Iman said or you know putting up putting on a mask or pretending to be someone you're not at the end of the day you need to show who you really are because if you don't think about playing someone or pretending to be someone you'll just feel much more comfortable in answering the question that you have prepared for. And you will be able to interact with the partner and establish a clear communication. So I think that the, the tip, and I'm sorry if I'm reiterating what Iman said, is being genuine. So be genuinely interested in the firm, be genuine about who you are. Um, and I think that will really uh, stand out and like make you stand out in your application because it'll make it unique and different because Everyone is different. If you show why you are interested, why you want to work at this specific firm, that will definitely make your application stand out from other people who will just, you know, regurgitate information that they have copy pasted from the website. Excellent. Thank you very much for that very, very, very helpful insight. I'm aware we're getting very close to the hour. So I suppose my final question to both of you, um, just a short shot, if there's one piece or one tip or one piece of advice you could give um, to our attendees and our graduates in, in regards to heading into this sort of this career, what would it be? Look, it's a long career. Make sure that you are, and, and, and I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be brutally honest, that it's, it's not an easy career. Um, there are long hours, there are crazy clients, there are crazy colleagues, sometimes you are the one who's crazy. Um, somewhere craziness will come into the, uh, come into the, into the story. Um, love what you're doing that's really important and and this is maybe to coming back to the genuineness question and to a certain extent a question which we do get about whether to be out or stay in the closet because i'm aware that a lot of people do um, end up going back into the closet uh, um, when they start their career is Look, if you're working really long hours, you don't want to have a second job as an actor. Because if you wanted to be an actor, you could have a far more glamorous job earning far more money, right? So if you're being a lawyer in a firm, be who you are. It takes the pressure off, you know, trying to keep up an act because it's, it's just plain exhausting. And I genuinely am speaking from experience because I tried doing that. And I was a worse lawyer for it and a worse employee for it. The second thing is, uh, and in that track, honestly, you don't want to be in work in a place and create a career in a place where you are not comfortable, where you are not appreciated for who you are, your identity. So hold on to the identity you have, evolve it, right? Be the best version of yourself, but be yourself. Um, apart from that, it's about having a long perception of your game because you know, it's not about the next six months or the end of your training contract or becoming an NQ or becoming a senior associate or even becoming a partner. Your career is such a long thing and, you know, your designation is just one aspect of it. Your expertise is one aspect of it. The firm looks for a holistic individual, not someone who is brilliantly articulate when it comes to a topic of law but you know you would fall asleep in their company as such that isn't a great lawyer which is why you know and I, this goes back to what fran was saying you know when you're talking about hobbies it is about hobbies be 
a whole person, not just about the law. And at the same time, be yourself, be passionate about what you're doing. And, you know, it's a fun career. Look, I've been a lawyer for a while now. And if my story was any way different, my career still won't be. I would still be a lawyer. Thank you, man. Um, I can't speak to what feels like having a career in this kind of uh, in this crazy world, but I can say of what I want to 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 pursue and to do. And I think my biggest piece of advice, and it's something that I've learned while I was at BCLP, is um, build your brand. And I know that this seemed like a reiteration to what Iman has just mentioned, but I think that it is really important to have self-awareness to what are those characteristics, those things that you want to achieve, you want to have, uh, and those boundaries that you will necessarily need to put. And by boundaries, I mean, what is, one, what is that you want out of a career or a workplace? Do you want an inclusive workplace or do you want a competitive workplace? So, so I think that sometimes we get, especially law students or in general students who are applying for, for vacation schemes or training contract in the legal world, sometimes they, they stop thinking about themselves and, and just get so... Uh, they, they start drowning into the whole research and I need to show that I am commercially aware and I'm a team worker and, I, and I'm a good, uh, atten- I have attention to detail, et cetera, et cetera. And we stop thinking about, okay, but what do we want? Where do we want to work? And I think that's really important because at the end of the day, if you, as, as Iman mentioned, if you think long-term, um, that's what you sh- you're supposed to do. Long-term, for example, I knew when I was offered the opportunity to work at BCLP, that for me, I wanted to work in a firm where not only the work was amazing, but also the culture and the people was amazing. And and that was fundamental for me. And I knew that that's something that I wanted and something that I wouldn't have negotiated for. It was kind of like a deal breaker, Um, a deal breaker in the positive sense because BCLP didn't break the deal. But if another firm would have offered me something like, you know, we're going to pay you more and give you better deals and better clients, I'm not sure if I would have said yes, because for me, at least personally, I knew that both the environment and the work was important. But that was me. And of course, it might be different to the people listening today. But that is something that everyone should do. Just stop one second, stop researching, stop looking at the firms you you're want to apply to or organizations you're applying to and, and think, what do I want to achieve? Where do I want to uh, arrive? What is my goal? Um, and ask yourself those questions before even applying because having the answers to those questions are definitely gonna, um, well, of course, better have a better application, but it, it, they're gonna help you out because they're gonna, there are going to be quite answers that are going to define who you are and what you want to achieve. And that is connected again to the, what is your brand? What makes you you and what you want to get out of your career in general? Thank you very much for that, both of you. Very appreciate That's some fantastic insight uh, for our students and graduates. However, we have over that this is the end of Student Bites this week. That is not all we have though, however, um, for those of you that are interested in Student Bites, uh, next week, the 26th uh, VF Corporation behind some of the biggest names like Vans uh, and North Face are hosting a similar event, which you'll be getting a link to uh, after this. You will also be receiving the graduate pack from BCLP to keep yourself more in the know on what we've discussed today. I'd like to say a big thank you um, to Fran and Iman and BCLP for joining us this afternoon and giving us their time to give us such an in-depth uh, insight into the firm. And to all of you who've attended, thank you very much for joining us. I've been George Wright. This has been my G-Work. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.